This is Tom Qualt Export and today we are testing one of the most interesting new CPUs from Intel, in my opinion anyway. This sub $200 CPU has the potential to grab the value crown today, with AMD 7nm CPUs being out of stock in large parts of the world. Let's go over the test systems for today's review. The AMD CPUs were tested on an ASRock B550M Pro 4 motherboard with the stock rate stealth cooler that comes with both the 5600X and the 3600 processors. Then we used two 8GB sticks of 32MHz CL16. These are dual rank memory modules and makes up for a total of 16GB of the DDR4 memory running in dual channel. The Intel Core i5-10600K does not come with a cooler, so I used a Cooler Master Hybrid 212 Black Edition for the stock results. I don't actually have the 10400 anymore, so the 10600K was configured as the 10400 in the BIOS with a 65W TDP, 4.3GHz single core boost and 4GHz all core boost. This will have it behave these pretty much the same as an actual 10400. Then we have the new 11400 which was tested with its stock cooler. This CPU has a single core boost of 4.4 GHz and a 2.6 GHz base clock. The all core boost was 4.2 GHz when running Cinebench R20. The 11400 has a cut down iGPU. The higher end i5 parts has an Intel UHD 750 which has 32 execution units, while the 11400 has the UHD 730 with only 24 execution units. I don't use the iGPU for anything, so it doesn't really matter much to me, but if you plan on gaming with the iGPU, I suppose uh, 11500 would make more sense. The Intel CPUs were tested on an Aorus C490 Elite AC with the latest BIOS update, which added support for Rocket Lake and with the Rocket Lake CPU, the GPU now runs with PCI Express 4.0. The memory was the same as for the AMD CPUs, and speaking of memory, you can now overclock memory on the new B560 and H570 series motherboards from Intel. We will test the effects of memory overclocking on this CPU in another video, but with all of this out of the way, let's get to the benchmarks. We start off with Cinebench R20. Here the 11400 scored an impressive 3906 uh, multi-core score and 536 single-core score. This is 10% faster than the stock 10600K and even edges out the stock 5600X for the multi-core score. This has to do with the stock cooler for the 5600X, the slab of aluminum that is the rate stealth. It's not enough to keep up the clocks during an all-core load on the 5600X, uh, but with a 212 Black Edition and PBO and Auto OC, the 5600X is beating out the 11400, but out-of-box performance is pretty similar for the two. The performance increase from the 10400 was an impressive 23%, so good job Intel. The next workload is Handbrake, where we transcode a video from 4K30 to 1080p30. In this workload, the 11400 was the fastest stock CPU, be being 15% quicker than the stock 10600K and 21% faster than the 10400. It also managed to beat out the stock 5600X, again for the same reason as with Cinebench R20, the rate stealth cooler is not good enough to keep the clocks up during an all-core load. Next up is rendering a video with some fusion particle effects, among other things. The 11400 was a minute quicker than the stock 10600K and a minute and 19 seconds faster than the 10400. Here though, the 5600X was a full minute ahead of the 11400, but this is still a very great result for the 11400. Moving on to the gaming benchmarks, we start off with Assetto Corsa Competizioni. We're doing a lap around Spa with 32 cars on the track. The 11400 matched the stock 10600K here with 102 frames per second on average and with similar frame times as well. This makes it 6% faster than the 10400 and 13% faster than the 3600, both sub $200 CPUs. The $300 5600X is 15% faster than the 11400 here, uh, as it should be given the price. 
Next up is Battlefield 5, a game that is very CPU intensive. We have raised the max FPS to 300 here, which lets the CPUs stretch the legs a bit. The 11400 is pulling out a win here with 208.2 frames per second on average, just edging out the stock 5600X and having an 11% lead over the 10400. Compared to the slightly more expensive R5600, the 11400 was 24% faster although the 3600 is still delivering a good experience with 167.5 frames per second on average. We also test this game at 1440p, but as you can see, all the CPUs perform pretty much within margin of error of each other, with the exception of the 3600, which is trailing slightly behind. Dota 2 is up next, and here the 11400 comes in second place, just edging out the 10600K, and being 14% faster than the 10400 and the R5600. The $300 5600X steals the show with 243 frames per second on average, beating out the 11400 by 26%. The Elder Scrolls Online is next, and this and many other MMOs are very dependent on single core performance, and as such the 11400 does a good job here. Coming in second place just behind the 5600X, the 11400 was 12% faster than the 10400, a decent increase and similar to the difference between the 5600X and the 3600. Next up then is Rainbow Six Siege, and with ultra settings and 50% render scaling, the 11400 comes in third place, sliding in between the 10600K and the R5 3600. The increase over the 10400 was 10% in this game, again a Decent generational increase. It's not quite able to match the 10600K here, and the 5600X is 16% ahead in this title. At 1440p, things remain pretty much the same, although it's much closer between the top three positions, with the 11400 taking third place. The Sims 4 is the next title, and here the 11400 is again able to edge out the 10600K and beat the 10400 by 11%. The R5 3600 is sliding, lagging a bit behind here, but the 5600X is taking the lead, being 14% faster than the 11400. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is our second to last game, and here at 1080p the 11400 is taking the second place, again edging out the 10600K and beating the 10400 by 8%. It's a full 20% faster than the 3600, but the 5600X is the fastest CPU again, beating out the 11400 by 8%. Moving to 1440p and we are seeing a GPU bottleneck with all the CPUs apart from the 3600 which is a bit slower. Warzone is the final game we tested, we dropped into a solo player lobby and ran a set route near the quarry, sometimes being killed in the middle of the run and having to start over, it was great fun, especially doing 3 runs with each GPU, it made for some interesting results. The 11400 came in second place with a rather large 7% lead over the stock 10600K and a more usual 13% lead over the 10400. Also being 23% faster than the similarly priced R5 3600. The 5600X is as usual the fastest CPU with 172.2 frames per second on average, it was 7% faster than the 11400. Now let's look at the average performance across these 8 games. So this is interesting, the 11400 is basically on par with the stock 10600K, the only game where the stock 10600K was faster was Rainbow Six Siege, all of the titles the 11400 was edging it out and in Warzone outright beating it. On average the 11400 is 12.5% faster than the 10400 and 11% faster than the 3600 both direct competitors. The 5600X is on average 14% faster than the 11400, but it's also like 62% more expensive if you can find it in stock at the MSRP. Which brings us on to the last charge, value. Here I used the prices I could find on PC Part Picker or the MSRP if there was no price, so the 10400 can be had for as little as $160, even less if you opt for the F version without the iGPU. This makes it slightly better value than the 11400, but overall I would much rather opt for the 11400 because it is a good bit faster in productivity workloads and it supports PCI Express 4.0 and I suppose AV AVX 5.12 if that matters to you, as well as being over 10% faster for gaming. 
The tables have really turned now with even the 10600K being better value than the R5 3600. For a budget or mid-range build I can highly recommend the i5 11400. The only reason for going with something like the R5 3600 would be like the upgrade path. The AM4 socket might not see any new CPUs, you, but you can go from the 6 core 12 thread 3600 all the way to the 16 core 32 thread 5950X if you need more CPU power. The upgrade path for the 11400 is less exciting with both the i7 11700K and the i9 11900K being 8 core CPUs. The upgrade path is just not as robust as it, as it is for AMD. How much that matters is up to you. Uh, and the Intel CPUs, they do use a bit more power than the AMD CPUs. But the 11400 is one of the better Intel parts. I don't have the Cor Corsair ARM 1000 available to me at this moment, so I'll have to come back to the powder later. I'll add it in a pin comment or something. But uh, the low-end i5 parts usually doesn't use a lot of power, so it shouldn't, shouldn't be too bad. The higher-end Rocket Lake CPUs have gotten some pretty harsh reviews, and, and rightly so in the case of the i9-10900K, but the i5 range seems to be where Rocket Lake shines, and with the supply issues for AMD, the i5-11400 is likely to be the best budget CPU for a while. So that's it from me for now, thank you so much for watching, and farewell for now.